All right, good morning, afternoon, uh, evening from Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee. Thanks for the folks who are joining us from across the world right now. Uh, I'm Professor Seth Bordenstein, Director of the Vanderbilt Microbiome Initiative. Uh, and our aim is to advance, share, and discover long-lasting principles and positive outcomes in the burgeoning microbiome field. Thank you for joining us. Uh, this will be a special seminar by Dr. Chan and a question and answer session. Uh, World Microbiome Day, first of all, is a celebration of all things microbial and the new imperative for the life sciences to pioneer uh, new microbial knowledge into the textbooks and new applications for health and agriculture. And I think Dr. Chan's work is doing both of that. Uh, and in that light, it's a terrific pleasure to welcome him and introduce him as our keynote World Microbiome Day seminar speaker. As many of you know, um, or you're going to get to know, Dr. Chan has done groundbreaking work on discovering and deploying features of bacterial viruses, otherwise known as bacteriophages, for treating antibiotic resistant bacterial infections uh, involving cystic fibrosis to skin infections. Dr. Chan is a research specialist or scientist at Yale University in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology, uh, where he has steadily innovated phage uh, therapy techniques, I think since 2013. He holds a PhD and BS from the University of Utah. He holds several awards, including from the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, Project High Hopes, Greenberg Family Foundation, and many, many more. He's also a highly sought after speaker. Um, I first saw Ben speak in the summer of 2018 at the Evolution Medicine and Public Health meeting, where he gave one of the standout mind-blowing talks. Uh, and so we've closely monitored his work since then, and we are very excited that he could join us today. He's a wonderfully charismatic scientist engaged in public media. You can find him on Public Radio International, featured in Aeon Magazine, Stat News, and you can even go on Netflix to the series Follow This, where one of the episodes covers his phage work from sewage to therapeutics. So please join me in thanking and welcoming him for our seminar. Uh, if you have questions, Dr. Chen has allowed us to uh, essentially jump into the conversation today during his seminar and engage in a, in a discussion. Um, and so in that sense, uh, we will look forward to taking chat questions, just type them into the box and then we can bring them up at the right time. So thanks again for joining us, Ben, and celebrating World Microbiome Day with Vanderbilt. Cool. Uh, thanks for having me and thanks for like crazy nice uh, introduction. I don't know, like, is that like a Vanderbilt thing or what? But whoa, you guys are like- It's all you. Crazy polite. Um, thank you for having me. Um, yeah, I'm super excited to be here. Um, so I'm gonna like minimize the like the video part. So like I can't, so I can see the slides. Um, so I guess just like, I don't know, chat or, or yell something if um, you have a question um, and, and I can try to answer it. So. Um, again, thanks for having me. I thought today I'd talk about, uh, I guess, what I do <laughs> um, here in uh, Connecticut. Um, and yeah, so basically I work at the, our phage therapy center, um, which covers the entire uh, bench to bedside, uh, well, environment to bench to, to bedside um, spectrum of uh, drug development. Um, and you know, so it starts discovery, then we develop in the lab. Uh, we actually end up using the phage in the lab in quite a few cases. Um, and then, you know, if something works, we keep doing it. If it doesn't, we go back and tweak it until we can get it right. Um, so, so this talk, I guess, uh, will involve all three of those sections. Um, we might as well start with uh, discovery um, and then we'll get through the other three sections. Um, but before we even get there, I thought I'd try to bring us to the same page um, and just give a super brief introduction to bacteriophages. And a lot of this is super basic, I realize, um, but I think, uh, well, what I do is pretty basic too. So I guess it is, but it's important to, um, to try and pull it all together. Um, so as, as you all probably know, cause you're all into microbiome, um, bacteriophages are the most numerous life forms on the planet. Um, and they were discovered maybe hundred years ago and they're pretty diverse actually, at least in terms of morphology and, and genetics. And then here's a, you know, we generated this cool little plot of, geez, I don't know, 150 or so of our phages. Um, and they fall into all these families. And then at least in, uh, not in this data set, but in, we, we regularly find phages that probably belong in a new family. Um, and so, you know, I think we were barely tapped into the, the discovery 
of this. Um, and we're sampling weekly and finding easily new genera um, and a lot of times uh, new families um, for some de definition of family. Um, so the life cycle, at least in the lytic phage life cycle, is pretty simple. It starts by the phage attaching to the host. And this talk's going to be full of these little cartoons. Hopefully um, they're clear. I, I don't know. I tried. I'm not the best artist. Um, but the first step is the phage attacks, attaches to the host. Um, and then once it does that, it injects its nucleic acid, um, you know, makes copies of it, makes particle pieces, fills the particles and assembles them. Uh, and then the last step is burst, where each of those new baryons go off to find new hosts. Okay, and so the first step of that is is actually really kind of a big piece of our work here. And so it's it's complicated in that uh, it requires the the bacteriophage to recognize very specific receptor or receptors, right? So not so you know it's tumbling around in the environment. It comes into contact with a potential receptor. Uh, if it's not the right one, it bounces off, right? So these protein sugars or whatever the receptors aren't present on all members of the genus and not even within a species. We have some, you know, phages that can infect like two strains of our panel, um, panels, right? And, and so they're ultra, ultra, ultra specific. However, once they find the right protein, sugar, whatever, their receptor finding site, they, they go through the process and do the thing, right? So they're super mega ultra specific. Um, and you know, is this a good thing or a bad thing? And if you're trying to develop them into therapeutics, that's been a sort of ongoing question. Historically, it's been viewed as bad, um, but I think now, in like you know, the more more modern times, I think it's viewed as a really good thing, especially now that we're appreciating you know the microbiome, right? And and disrupting it seems to be not the best thing, um, unless you guys tell me otherwise. Um, you guys are the experts there for sure. Um, but anyway, if you, if you look at this, uh, you know, life cycle and just think of it as an infection slash predation pressure in a closed system between single phage species, if you call it that, uh, and a bacteria species, if people call it that species, um, eventually, you know, evolution, selection, whatever happens and a mutation will arise in that population, giving the bacteria, uh, the ability to escape infection from phage, right? So what we do here is we sort of try and capitalize upon this uh, by uh, specifically targeting certain receptors, right? And with the hope that we can use this evolutionary response to direct and reduce uh, antibiotic resistance and, uh, you know, in some cases, attenuate virulence, right? Because with any sort of anti-infective you deploy, bacteria will eventually become resistant. And we're, our plan here is to basically I guess when, when the bacteria evolve resistance and that we killed off most of the bacteria. Um, and then that when they evolve resistance, you know, it comes at some trade off that would be beneficial for, for the treatment of disease or infection. So um, if you think of it this way, we've got like a sort of a spectrum there where, where on the left side, there's a really virulent and, and or uh, antibiotic resistant strains. Um, and then toward the, you know, the right side of this figure where phage resistance has evolved and then they have, you know, reduced antibiotic resistance and attenuated treatments, right? So it's sort of a, a spectrum here. Um, and so we're, we're calling this sort of targeting of these specific virulence factors sort of phage therapy 2.0, um, which is, I guess, the focus of our work where we're trying to do what I just said is to sort of force these trade-offs. And here's some of the targets that we're currently looking at um, in, in many of the species. Okay, so that's the background. Okay, so now to the discovery section, right, of the talk. So finding phage is like pretty easy for, you know, most species. There are always a few that make it really difficult for some reason. Um, but say for E. coli or Pseudomonas, like you can find phage in almost any sample, right? Uh, but finding good candidate, candidates for therapy uh, is, is a lot less simple, um, believe it or not. So, we focus on uh, a lot of our efforts on that. Um, and so the first step is isolation. And so this is where we get a, a water sample, a sewer sample, pond sample, you know, compost ditch, whatever. Um, and then we do a basic enrichment on some species of bacteria. And here's several of the ones that we work with quite a bit. Um, and we then, you know, try and purify them. So we have a single phage because in a lot of these sewage samples, like for E. coli or something, you're gonna have dozens of 
different phage species within that sample. So we purify them, so we have single phages. Um, and then we try to identify the receptor either by uh, spotting these phages and testing infectivity on transpose on knockouts or uh, sequencing bacteria that evolve resistance spontaneously. Um, so once we identify the receptor, we sequence the whole phage genome and try to characterize it there to remove those that would be mm, the temperate phages, for example. So those that aren't obligate lytic, we, we don't generally use for therapy. Um, and then we try to characterize their lytic spectrum. So that's basically a panel where we test how well each of these phages infects uh, a bunch of different strains. So for example, here's a table of 100 uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa isolates from the CF Foundation that we received. And then with each column being a different uh, strain and each row being a different phage in the collection. Um, and then with red being resistant and green being susceptible bacteria. Okay, so we have these big libraries of phage that we're constantly isolating and, and characterizing. Um, and then we wanna maybe say, develop this into a, a therapeutic or another research project, but we'll just talk about the therapeutic ones here. So, hey, yeah. Hey, uh, this, is, this is Seth. I wanted to ask hey. a question about uh, how much do you think about the specificity spectrum of the phages when you're selecting them? In other words, if they have off targets in other strains or other species or genera, are you ruling them in or out in some way? Uh, yeah, so that really depends on the nature of the infection. Um, so a lot of our, uh, you know, shigellophage, for example, can kill E. coli. Um, some can kill Klebsiella, Citrobacter. Um, so we have some that can cross genera. Um, and so depending on the nature of the infection, that could be uh, potentially problematic. Um, if we're targeting a virulence factor, I think ultimately it might not be, but we're trying to use phages that don't disrupt uh, off target species at least, um, even though it might have a virulence factor. So in if it was like a, a gut infection, we'd have to worry about that a lot more versus like a joint, prosthetic joint infection is typically, at least in our experience, a single species. And so the phages don't really get out of that space and, uh, we believe aren't able to impact like other aspects of the microbiome and we're focused specifically on that space. But great, yeah. thank you. Yeah, cool. Okay, so um, so next thing we look at is the mutational spectrum of resistance. So um, this is actually pretty uh, critical for what we're doing. Here we go. So we have uh, plenty of, you know, you know, there's a, in this case, you have a phage sensitive and virulent bacteria, you throw phages at it. Uh, and then what comes out, you know, we could be phage resistant and hypervirulent. So you, we have to be extra, extra careful when selecting these. It's not just find the phage that kills it, throw it at it, um, and then call it good. Um, so we have to be a little bit more responsible um, or else we could have something that that is making the infection worse, okay? So, uh, so anyway, so that was just my random ramp there. So in terms of development, we wanna look at this mutational spectrum of resistance, right? So we have all these isolates, again, the same table as before and all these phage. Um, so, but maybe we'll just look at three phage. Um, so we'll look at uh, H6, uh, TIPP27, TIPP01. Um, and here, you know, H6 can kill 76 strains and cannot kill 24. Uh, 27 can kill 65, but not 35 of them. Um, so we have these guys, okay? So looking at just these three phages on all 100 hosts, um, they're named uh, TIVP because they all use the type 4 pillus as their receptor binding site. And then, you know, these random numbers from the source or the well. So this one is found in well H6 of a 96 well plate. Very unexciting. This one's sample number 27 from one of my sampling trips, um, for example. Anyway, so we, we're just looking at these three phages. Um, we then took the ones that were sensitive to the phage, each of these strains. Uh, and we took five uh, biological replicates for each strain. Um, and then we exposed them to bacteria, phage, sorry, exposed them to bacteria phage uh, and isolated uh, resistant mutants. So spontaneous resistant mutants to each of these phages times five for each of the uh, isolates from the CF Foundation that were sensitive to that phage. And we then sequenced them, the genome uh, on this Illumina NovaSeq. Um, and then, you know, I wrote a bunch of Python scripts to sort of uh, help identify some receptors here or, or changes in the genome. 
Um, so the first step is remove poor quality reads. And the next one is we remove perfect alignments of each of these reads that uh, aligns to the phage sensitive ancestor. So we also sequence, you know, the, the parent strain. Um, and then all the reads that had 100% alignment to that, we tossed out um, because this, the total data set here ended up being pretty big. And so it would take a bunch of computing time. And so we threw out all those reads. And then we basically took the SNPs that didn't align to that using the you know BLAST uh, aligner um, per nucleotide, per gene, per pathway to generate these host maps, uh, sorry, heat map of, of SNPs. Um, and that uh, ended up being a really big heat map and definitely like, so I would love some input from you guys because you guys are all the experts here. Um, but so you get this big heat map of all this, you know, trash, possibly um, variation, whatever. So we tried to reduce this into something meaningful by um, converting this to Z scores, uh, and then P values, and then removing the false positives by uh, grouping hits by gene, then by pathway. Um, and then we, we bond for and corrected for multiple comparisons. And like this yellow is a, a, is the significance uh, that the brighter the yellow, the more significant. Um, and when we do it this way, basically it weeds out a good chunk of stuff um, into these four genes, um, which are uh, all involved in the type 4 pillus, which is, uh, it's nice to know that that's what happened, right? So it's like an on-target effect there. Um, and then, oh, whoops, sorry. So yeah, so it basically came down to four genes really standing out uh, involved in PILIS, um, especially this uh, PIL L, CHPA, chemosensory protein A involved, is involved in the regulation of the type 4 PILIS. Um, and then there was one strain that didn't have a mutation there, but it had mutations in all these other PILIS genes. Okay. So, you know, that told us that we have this, you know, all the possible genes that could give it resistance, but it seems like it really came down to, um, the receptor being the easiest thing to change for these uh, bacteria, um, which is good for us, I think. Um, and then it, so then we also get to ask a lot, you know, is it better to use cocktails or single application of phage, right? So why not just take every possible anti pseudomonas phage, throw it into one cocktail and use that to treat an infection rather than using one phage and another than another. And that's that a lot. Um, and, and you know, to address that, we did a lab experiment here uh, in E. coli this time, because it's an easier system to work with. Um, so we use a lab strain BW2513, which I've been mistakenly calling K12, but I guess there's some subtle difference between the two that is uh, for the experts um, to tell me. Um, but that's the lab strain we use, and then we use four well-characterized phage. Um, and, and using the same naming convention, we give the, the presumed receptor, um, and then a name. So the LPS C for like core LPS uh, is T7's receptor. OMP A, RNA member protein A is this R3. TSX is the receptor of U115, which is also the type 6 receptor, um, which is why it's called TSX. Um, and then we have TOL C, uh, which is the outer membrane protein of uh, antibiotic efflux gene um, as a receptor for U136B. Okay. So we have these four characterized receptors, and then we wanted to put this to the test. Should we? do serial or cocktail uh, application. And so we tested this by taking a control or a single culture of E. coli and then exposing it to each of the four phage separately and then from and then letting it grow uh, in evolve resistance and then basically exposing it to each of the three phage that you didn't see before um, and then two of the phage that it hadn't seen yet and then finally the last phage. We did every combination of of the order of the, the bacteria phages. Um, and then we did all the pairs, triplets, and then the four uh, phage cocktail. Um, and then did a control that we just serially passaged um, that would be used to normalize and remove the reads that align to it. Um, and so we did this whole experiment uh, in triplicate. Um, and we're still analyzing some of the data. We also did it in triplicate for this, and we also did it in a mutator strain. So. The data here is just for the non-mutator chain. We still have to look at the mutator. Um, but this was like a lot of sequencing, right? So we sequenced the whole population at each of these time points. Um, and so there was a lot, lot, lot of data that came out of this. Um, hey, Ben. And then, 
Another yeah. question from me. Sure. Um, how, how swiftly does it take resistance to evolve in this particular experiment? Uh, yeah, overnight you get resistance. Okay. Yeah. And in the cocktail, it maybe takes a little bit longer, but I, we set it for uh, 48 hours just so that we'd have enough to sequence. Yeah, that's impressive. Yeah. And then yeah. what was your hypothesis going into this work about whether the monophage versus the cocktail design would work out? Yeah, so the hypothesis was that basically the receptor binding site would be the part that changed um, in the single exposed phage. And then we would eventually come up at the end with receptors, you know, all four receptors modified. Whereas if we threw everything at once, we were thinking that it would probably be an LPS modification that just messed with all the uh, other expression of some of these proteins on the surface. Um, that, was, that was the hypothesis. And we got kind of close, I think. Um, Thanks. So yeah. So we tested at each of these points also, um, we as in Katie Courtright, a grad student in the lab who like for some reason likes to torture herself with lots and lots and lots of work, um, decided to test at each of these days, um, the, sense, the cross resistance to the other phages, um, some antibiotic resistance, um, and then also uh, looked at the phenotype. And the first thing that came out immediately was this mucoid phenotype. That was a very obvious uh, uh, change in the culture. Um, and she also quantified the bacteria that came out as well. So we have, we have that too. Um, so mucoidy came out readily and we found it to be associated very strongly, significantly with T7 exposure. So this guy that uses this core bit of LPS seems to select for mucoidy um, as its way to evolve resistance. Um, that mucoidy also uh, happens when exposed to a cocktail. Um, so, so that happens almost immediately. Um, and mucoidy also results in cross resistance. So once you've evolved mucoidy, you're resistant to uh, all the phage. Um, so then why mucoidy, right? So if you, in, if you look at the simplified cartoon here, you see you know, these four um, receptors uh, and mucoid is just like a, a capsule that forms on the outside and potentially covers these receptor sites or make it difficult for the phage to find it. It's our sort of working hypothesis. Um, so if that happens, it's a simple mutation where it just becomes resistant to all the phage, right? So why wouldn't these bugs just become mucoid? Um, and so does that mean they're all destined to become mucoid? Uh, no, actually. I mean, it, it might in that experiment. However, like in a, in a more real world situation, uh, we have other phages that are a little bit bizarre, but seem to have enzymes or something that degrade the capsule and they actually require mucoidy for infection. So we can force a trade-off between mucoidy and non-mucoidy and that it's 100% resistant once it loses its uh, capsule to this phage. Um, and actually in those mucoid uh, mutants that we collected in the previous experiments and stuff that's still going on now, but it seems to restore sensitivity completely when we expose it to this phage uh, and evolve existence to this phage. So we can toggle that switch and we're, and we're still working on experiments to see how long we can keep going back and forth. Okay, so when we looked at the sequencing of those, um, those the bugs that came out of that uh, big experiment, we looked at the on-target and off-target mutations. So the on-target being, you know, mutations in the receptor, um, and then off-target being all other mutations that came out as statistically significant. So uh, when exposed to a single phage, about almost two-thirds of the mutations were in the receptor binding site. Um, but that number drops way down once we uh, pair, throw other phages from pair to triple for the four phage, it goes 22% um, or 22, yeah, percent. Um, 20, this adds up to more than 100. Um, so I'm not sure what those numbers are actually. Maybe it's some weird Excel rounding thing or something. But um, most of the mutations are actually not in the receptor um, site. Ah, it's total number. Sorry, that's what it is. Total number, 20% in this case. Um, and then less than 10% of the, of the mutations are actually in the receptor when we use three phage cocktail and about 10% in the four phage. And then this cocktail is just uh, a combination of all the, all three of these groups. So, you know, in terms of off-target, on-target mutations, we definitely see a more predictable 
more prediction power in the single phage uh, used serially, right? So this these 37 mutations just accumulated over time. And so they weren't new. So basically after round two, if there's an off-target mutation, it was still counted again um, in the round, second round. So obviously there's, there's some work we can do there. But um, anyway, so I, I think this gives us a little bit of uh, proof that maybe the single serial phage might be uh, potentially useful. Um, when we looked at the using the same sort of presentation as before, with yellow being more significant than not, um, the single phage exposed uh, strains here in the top section were have a, a far fewer significant mutations, as you can see. Um, and these are the genes for the receptor. Um, and so it looks like it has a stronger predictive power. Okay. So, um, but then like, you know, the, but I, I don't, people always think that I'm super anti-cocktail when I talk and, and I'm really not. It just depends on the infection. I think everything always just depends, right, in biology. And I think for an infection, it especially depends, right? So in the case of an acute, otherwise uncomplicated, but drug resistant infection, I'm all in favor of a cocktail because the likelihood of uh, resistance is, is actually lower in many of these uh, bacteria, right? Mucoidy is a potential problem, definitely. But in terms of like number of uh, bacteria present in the infection, that goes way down in these cases. And then, you know, in cases where it's uncomplicated and the person is functioning the immune system or there's other uh, drugs that could be used, um, then a cocktail is a perfect use of it. Um, however, in some of the cases that we work on in terms of like, you know, chronic uh, lung infections and CF, where there's a high chance of recolonization or reinfection, um, sequential might be better in that we can sort of sculpt and, and modify the, uh, the sort of resident population um, so that when they do have an exacerbation, it's easier to manage um, with existing tools or, you know, it might reduce the incidence of exacerbation because the existing population there outcompetes, you know, invading bacteria that might want to try and set up um, when there's already something in that niche. Okay, so deployment of phage. So this is where we actually, once we get through the first two steps, we're ready to start using them, right? Um, and so delivery of phage is not as simple as a lot of these chemical antibiotics because they have actually pretty poor tissue penetration, right? So you can't just uh, well, you can't just go IV route of administration for all infection types. Um, I think there are definitely groups out there that are trying this, um, but it's not clear to me that those phages actually ever end up in the site of infection. Um, it looks like they're just cleared from the blood pretty quickly. Um, so, you know, as we were discussing earlier, phage require physical contact with bacteria in order to kill them. Um, and so, our approach here has been to, you know, utilize some sort of delivery that maximizes uh, contact between the phage and bacteria. So ideally direct installation into an infection um, if possible. Um, so then I guess I'll start talking about a few of the cases we've treated. Um, so the first case we treated uh, was in 2016. Um, so it took us, you know, so I started working on you know, this phage for therapy stuff in 2013. So it took us, you know, a couple of years to get the end of 2013. So it took a couple of years to get all that background work, build up a library um, and make sure we're doing the right thing. Um, but then sort of this case sort of just appeared on our radar. Um, and this was an 80 year old guy with an aortic aneurysm. Um, and so that would be for um, everyone here, this is the aorta, the big uh, vessel coming out of the heart. Um, and, and then the aneurysm would be a thinning of the walls um, and so, you know, it balloons out and if it ruptures, that's, you know, death in, in seconds, right? So that's a very dangerous situation to have. And so um, he went the surgery to have it repaired in Ju July 2012. Um, and they replaced that chunk of the aorta with um, a Dacron graft. So they grafted uh, the aorta here. Um, and then immediately he had some sort of infection. Um, so early 2013, he, he was back in hospital with uh, pseudomonas in the blood. Um, and he'd also developed a um, draining fistula. So this is basically a, uh, basically a hole that formed from the base of the aorta here 
sorry, because we already here since you haven't seen me point, um, to the surface. So he has a, a, a hole that's draining out uh, pus and actually Pseudomonas um, in 2013. So at this point, they managed him with uh, IV um, antibiotic, uh, ceftazidime, um, and then also Cipro. Um, and they debrided a bunch of the, the chest wall here, um, removed the sternum actually. Um, so in the calendar year 2013, he was in the hospital three times with the same problem with more and more drainage. So there's, a, there's a real infection problem here that's not being sorted out with the uh, antibiotics. Uh, at the end of 2014, he had a bunch of, you know, they did a scan and saw a bunch of fluid collection down here in this uh, site. Um, and so every time they would stop doing the IV antibiotics, he'd come back in a week um, with bacteria in the blood, right? So it was pretty clear that the IV antibiotics were definitely clearing the blood infection, but uh, they weren't doing anything at the root cause here of this infection. So, and then in 2015, uh, September, if I remember, um, there actually was a bit of blood coming out of this fistula. And so the, the team was worried that this meant that there was, the infection was sort of eroding into the aorta. And if that were true, that's the similar to scenario to uh, aorta, um, uh, sorry, to the um, aneurysm rupturing, and then he, he was gonna bleed out, right? And so they needed a solution and the antibiotics were not working. So this guy's problem really was that, you know, elective surgical management was not possible uh, because he's, a, he's an older guy and he'd been to, oh geez, four or five centers uh, who actually declined him because of risk of mortality if they tried to swap out this piece. Um, and so basically there were no existing uh, solutions. And so we thought phages might be useful here potentially. Um, and so we, we pulled the strain uh, from the drainage. Um, we had several, several time points and they were all identical in terms of uh, antibiotic sensitivity and phage sensitivity. So we pulled the strain and then we tested the, the minimum inhibitory concentration to these four antibiotics, Cipro, Gentamicin, Tovamicin, and Ceftazidine. Um, then these black horizontal bars here are the clinical breakpoint as of these must be 2018. Um, and they might've changed since then, but it doesn't look like it, but maybe. Um, and uh, so we basically in the lab evolved resistance to the phage. Uh, and then retested the MIC, and we got a significant reduction in MIC in all these cases um, by using a phage that targeted the outer membrane protein of a uh, multi drug efflux pump. Um, and so, what we did was we decided to use ceftazidine here um, in combination with, um, with this phage, um, and we applied it to the basically up the fistula. Original plan was we we're going to puncture through the, the fluid drainage. Uh, drain it out and irrigate with phage, which was my preferred uh, approach. But um, the issue was it was heavily scarred. And so they were unable to actually access the site. So we had to basically do it from the outside. Um, we did a single application um, and then basically sent him home. And then uh, four weeks later, um, his wound had resolved and um, they stopped antibiotic administration. And it looks like the infection completely cleared. Um, yeah, so and it is published in 2018. If you want to read it, here's the, the citation. Hey, Ben, another um, question. Yeah, yeah. And just a re reminder to the community, feel free to uh, type your questions out in the chat box and we can ask them. Uh, in this case, what what allowed the, it, it sounds like there was tissue penetration of the phage application then since it came from the outside. Is that correct? Then what allowed that, do you think? Uh, I, if I had to guess, so I think it was just tracking up the fistula. So that draining hole was full of pseudomonas. Um, and if I had to guess, uh, probably some biofilm in there, possibly. Um, and then basically we, we ran the fluid up that, that the hole and it, it tracked up there. Um, and possibly it was amplifying phage as it tracked up. That's, right. that's my best guess. Yeah. yeah, that's an interesting principle. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Okay, so then, you know, maybe a few months after that case, uh, we were contacted by a young woman's physician in Texas uh, who had this patient, this 22 year old uh, female with cystic fibrosis, which is a genetic, um, genetic uh, disease that uh, results in uh, chronic lung infections 
um, which is like what's really well known for that. Um, and so this woman was experiencing accelerated decline in pulmonary function, um, and she was in the middle of like a pretty bad exacerbation due to pen resistant pseudomonas aeritinosa. Um, this plot on the right here is uh, her, it's a, it's a measure of her lung function. It's the FEV1% predicted, which is the forced expiratory volume at one second of, of air at one second and based on some prediction. So she should, I guess you and I, we should be um, at 100% if we are feeling healthy, right? Um, so when you get sick, that number drops um, and you're less uh, able to, to breathe out uh, as much air. Um, so this, this this is each one of these vertical bars here is a week's worth of time. So, you know, several years she's experiencing this decline. Um, and she has two big major issues here is the bacterial burden and inflammation, which that's actually driving pulmonary decline. Um, and then she also has this other problem of antibiotic resistance, which is, you know, ubiquitous among the CF community, right? Because they're on antibiotics um, half their life, right? So you're, the current suggestion is, you know, every other month you're on uh, inhaled antibiotics for the whole month, and then you have a rest month and then you're back on. So um, we have you a question. Up. Yeah. Oh, sorry. sorry I didn't see it. Trying to break in in the, in the middle there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Perseus has a question. Hi, Dr. Chen, big fan of your work and uh, follow your, so, sorry, since we came up with cystic fibrosis, I work in the clinical microbiology lab at Vanderbilt. So we see a lot of these patients uh, actually sort of want to come through. Um, the question about Ella Balassa was for me always, and I'm a bench technologist, I'm not a doctor or anything. Um, we see a lot of alginate production by the pseudomonas yep. and how, yep. do, like I saw that her form of intake of the phage was also through the nebulizer form. So um, do, uh, a, are the pseudomonas more resistant to the phage when they produce a lot of these polysaccharide capsules like alginate or um, what kind of pseudomonas do you usually go for in these pan resistant? Because pan resistant pseudomonas in cystic fibrosis patients can be like non-mucoid, mucoid, what, what have you been seeing and, and, and how are these patients being resolved? Are they coming back for another bout of this uh, phage therapy? And, and it's, it's, I'm, I'm really curious because I think this is the future of uh, antimicrobial resistance and um, especially targeted versus just carpet bombing these bacteria. Um, mm -hmm. So um, big fan of your work, thank you. Oh, oh thanks. Um, so, so this, this case here actually is not, um, Ella, but she's, I, she's, I think she talked about her stuff in here. Um, but, but yeah, so you're absolutely right. Um, what did we target? Did it come back a lot? So, um, in her case, it was, uh, that the mucoidy was less of a problem. Um, the alginate production can definitely, uh, impact phage sensitivity, um, to many of our phages. However, a lot of them are sort of uh, capsule independent for some reason. And then we also have some pseudomonas phage similar to that E. coli phage that can that require the capsule to infect. So we can basically, what we do now, I mean, so this, this case was four years ago, um, but what we do now is basically we get a sputum sample, we isolate tons of uh, strains from the sputum sample because um, as, as, as you know, and, and the CF lung is like a big ecosystem with like tons of different uh, strains, right? So it's never, it's very rarely just one strain that is uh, existing in the CF lung. So, you know, there's dozens of communities of pseudomonas and other things. Um, and so we, we isolate as many bacteria as we can. Um, and then we, um, uh, then test the phage sensitivity uh, on this panel um, with trade-offs. And then we sort of just make a decision, I guess, on what to do. Um, and are they, how are they managed? So our course, uh, it, it, with the exception of this case right here, our course is typically seven days uh, once daily nebulized um, for outpatient and then for you know inpatient whether it's emergency, if they're in the intensive care unit, we do it three times a day. And then if they're just admitted to hospitals twice a day um, with the dose being similar in, in all the cases. Um, in, if it's outpatient, we, we're a little bit limited in our uh, ability uh, to do some of the management just because of uh, FDA permission sort of stuff, right? So uh, that's changing now that we're working on a compassionate use sort of application for many, many patients. But basically uh, we, we have to get them out of the 
uh, a critical state. And so if they can get discharged, then it's more, uh, it's, it's less of a, less in our hands, um, but uh, we can repeat treat. And then we have, I'm presenting mm, one, maybe two cases. I always forget which one I talk about that have had repeat treatments. Um, and it really depends on, on the individual because sometimes we drop the bacteria burden way down. Um, and then, you know, within a month it's back up again. Uh, it, although they might not be having an exacerbation the, the number goes way up and then other times it stays really low and it really just depends on the individual. So hopefully that's helpful. It's like a long answer. Um, I guess as always, it's just, it depends. Um, okay, so, um, so her case here, here was the, the sensitivities on the, on the pseudomonas that came out of her uh, and it was resistant to all these drugs. Um, and so I took the sputum culture or sputum and cultured out bacteria. Um, and then we identified a bunch of phage able to kill the strain um, in the lab. Um, I grew it in a biofilm and then I tested uh, this uh, strain um, for, I exposed it to antibiotic um, that she was on um, and then phage alone and then antibiotic plus phage. Um, at the antibiotic is two times the MIC determined in the lab. And then I exposed the biofilm to whatever treatment for 24 hours uh, and then basically sonicated it and then pulled out what the viable bacteria. And so we saw, you know, it's an order of magnitude reduction um, with phage, uh, no change in the antibiotic treatment. And then together we saw a couple order of magnitude reduction, which doesn't sound like a lot, but um, it actually was pretty um, uh, effective. So we then tested the consequences of these uh, antibiotic sensitivities. So we looked at these guys here, and then we tested the MIC of the antibiotics after, and then the phage sensitive ones had this, you know, were still resistant as expected. Um, and then the once once they evolved phage resistance were, um, uh, significantly reduced MIC. Okay, so we actually saw a reversion from resistance to sensitivity. So, and also a reduction in number, right? So our approach here was to use phage for 10 days. Um, and, you know, almost immediately we saw a big change in the antibiotic sensitivity. So we saw resensitization in, in you know, two, three classes of antibiotics. Um, or maybe, um, and a big improvement in FEV1, in addition to a significant reduction in sputum density of bacteria. So within uh, a week here, her FEV1 jumped way up to, you know, in the 70s. Um, and then it had this basic gradual improvement. Um, so this improvement was sustained for about three years. Um, she had FEV1 in the, over 90% uh, in 2020. Um, which was back where she was, you know, when she was a teenager, um, and she didn't have any hospitalizations due to exacerbation for three years, where previously she was hospitalized two to three times per year uh, with an exacerbation. Uh, and she was treated, I guess, uh, I have to look again, but I think she was treated twice, um, six, uh, four months after the first treatment um, as an outpatient. Okay, so uh, this third case here. Um, this is one that we treated in, in hospital. Um, there's a 71 year old man, let's see, 15 minutes left. Okay. Um, uh, who had a uh, non-CF bronchiectasis. We had a, a bunch of damage to his lungs from smoke inhalation. He's a firefighter um, and he had a building collapse on him like in, in the eighties sometime. Um, and so he, you know, got dragged out of this burnt up building with really bad smoke inhalation. It, it really scarred up his lungs. Um, and he was carrying this chronic pseudomonas um, infection for years um, before we got, we saw him 10 years or so in our records. Um, we treated him here, uh, same vertical lines are each a week. Um, the green is during treatment. So we came in here, he is in the, um, in the hospital. We treated him with, um, uh, with phage uh, for a week, and we saw a big reduction, of, uh, you know, almost three order of magnitude reduction in sputum density of bacteria. Um, and we saw resensitization to Cipro um, 
And then one curious side effect was this uh, reduction in, in pyocyanin. So the, the pseudomus produces this green pigment. Um, but once phage resistance occurred, we saw a big reduction in that to none. Um, and then we have people um, investigating that now. Um, but he basically, he was well enough to be released from the hospital after our phage uh, intervention. Um, and then we treated him as an outpatient a few months later. It looked like the bacteria had not increased in density while he was away. Um, and then we treated him again uh, with phage. And then uh, he got below cultura, uh, our limit of detectum limit of detection of uh, bacteria after that then was culture negative for, for quite a while um, after that um and and also managed to stay out of the hospital for uh you know for exacerbations for a couple of years um this other case here is a, a, a young woman with uh, cf again um severe lung disease so her uh, fev one was like 18 percent um in a normal case. And she had a severe exacerbation due to resistant pseudomonas. We treated with this same phage um, and saw a big reduction at uh, three orders of magnitude or so in sputum bacteria, uh, resensitization to Cipro uh, and the change in pyocyanin and a slight improvement in her FEV1 um, by the time she was sent home. Okay, so the top, top plate here is her isolate uh, before treatment and then the bottom oops, bottom row is uh, after phage therapy. So we see a change suggesting strongly that the phage are actually getting to the site. Um, so um, so that that pyocyanin observation led to some other work where, where we were interested in seeing um, not much time here, uh, how that might impact inflammation because pyocyanin is known to be inflammatory, right? Um, and so we on the left here we tested relative pyocyanin production per CFU um, after exposure to antibiotics or this phage H6, which uses PET4 pillus um, plus minus um, antibiotic. And we saw that you know exposure to phage um, resulted in less pyocyanin um, and we were able to actually get rid of the effect of some of these antibiotics, which actually should an increase in our assay. Um, and then another uh, member of the group here, she studied, um, so this is way not my field, but she studied in cell culture and in mice, the impact of the supernatant of these uh, strains. So the ones with and without uh, phage exposure. So basically measure, trying to measure the effect of pyocyanin um, and saw a significant reduction um, in inflammatory markers in tissue culture and in a mouse model that she tested. Um, so, aha, microbiome impact. So this stuff is, is where I, I certainly need help and, and where um, your expertise would be appreciated um, and input. Um, but we sequenced basically a cohort of, uh, I guess, 25 pulmonary cases here before, during, and after phage therapy. We sequenced the whole bacterial pop community. Um, deep sequence, not, uh, not just the 16S. So we have all the, the genomes here. Um, and we saw no change, uh, you know, in the before, during, uh, one month after, and then some of them going way out to you know a year after um, in the species diversity and abundance. Um, and then we also didn't see any big changes. I don't think in terms of like the um, the evenness. Um, in terms of the, the bacteria species that we weren't targeting. Obviously with respect to Pseudomonas or uh, Acromobacter, whatever we were targeting at the time, that species dropped way off. Um, but it doesn't look like doing that opened up a niche for you know, a new species to take over like strep or something, didn't just like explode and, and, and dominate the sputum culture. So, so it looks like we're able to get a slight uh, sorry, no change in the, the microbiome, the lung microbiome at least. Um, so uh, in a cohort of all of our, of 10 of our cystic fibrosis cases, we saw an average FEV1% predicted improvement of seven and a third percent. Um, a, a typical reduction of is three logs of reduction of bacteria at sputum density. Um, and then, you know, obviously the, the patients are reporting 
self-reported improvement in quality of life, but that we need to get more objective, but people are texting me. I'd like, you know, text a lot of these people a lot and, and I've made some really good friends out there. And, and, you know, we're talking about how they're feeling and it looks like they're doing a lot better. Um, so those were all done with, you know, uh, I guess, compassionate use. Um, and, oh, actually, sorry, just jumping way back. I actually didn't present Ella's in the case here. So sorry about that. I'm, we can talk about that one after, if there's time. Um, so um, anyway, so, uh, so what are the next steps for us? I mean, so we do know or strongly believe that phage arrive at site of infection um, and kill the target bacteria. Um, and that they can seem to drive a predictable response in bacteria in terms of like the phenotypes we observe and antibiotic sensitivities. Um, and they can potentially reduce virulence based on our uh, cell culture and, and mouse studies. Um, and they don't appear to disrupt the microbiome of the lung, um, but we need to look at other locations obviously, but so far it's looking really encouraging. Um, and they can, most importantly to me at least, uh, improve clinical status and they get these people home and try and keep people out of the hospital. Um, so the next step would be, you know, so we've previously been doing all these compassionate use cases. Um, and then, but the real thing we need to be doing is a clinical trial, right? Um, and so that's what we're doing. Um, I guess is the gold standard, right? It's double blind, placebo controlled, but crazy expensive. Um, I'm finding more and more every day. Um, but our trial as it is now is, you know, we have a treatment in placebo, 18 of each. We give them phage, um, one of three phages that we had produced for a clinical trial. Um, we then treat them uh, once a month and then for three months. And then at the end of the trial, we, uh, we, we do a crossover. So we allow the placebo to be treated and then the treatment is just observed. Um, and then we're looking to see if the endpoint is successful, which is reduction in uh, sputum density bacteria as the primary endpoint and the secondary being um, some of these other metrics. Um, if it doesn't work, we got to find more money, tweak things and try again, but um, we're hopeful. Um, it's currently enrolling. I've um, got a few patients involved. Um, here's the IND number. If you guys have any um, uh, individuals that you think would be interested, definitely send them our way and I can put them in touch with the clinical coordinator. Um, so, oh, okay, so that's that's the end of that bit. We're also doing a bunch of other cases I can talk about here in a sec, but at this point, I really, really, really have to thank um, the cystic fibrosis community because um, they're the absolute best uh, community ever. Um, I love working with them. Um, these individuals have like given their sputum, their time, their money, um, and in unfortunately many cases, their lives um, for, for everyone else, right? So they're, they're contributing all of this, uh, these resources to allow people to try and develop anti-infectives um, to improve uh, quality of life for everyone. And absolutely none of this work could ever possibly be done without them. Um, and so they definitely deserve all the recognition possible. Um, none of the work at all could be done without uh, all these people, Katie, Paul, John, Gail, Maya, Emily, uh, Sean, uh, Megan, um, et cetera. They've been invaluable in the lab. Um, and, and definitely thank you to all you guys for sitting through this uh, probably kind of rambly uh, talk. Um, my contact details are in the bottom right here. If you guys, that's my cell, so you guys can text me or call me or whatever if you want, um, email or, or the only social I use is Instagram. Um, but we're also treating, um, so I just talked about the pulmonary cases here because um, that I felt was more microbiome related, but we're also working in prosthetic joint space uh, quite a bit now. Um, uh, and th and that, that seems to be going really well too, um, but I guess it's less relevant to the microbiome. So with that, I guess I could be a three minutes or whatever, and I could take some more questions if there are any. Thank you very much, Ben. And I encourage everybody online to, to give virtual thanks or even take off your mics and, and take off your videos and give them a thanks. Um, uh, that was enlightening and charts 
a path forward for all of us here at Vanderbilt to think more serious, serious about. We do a, a lot of thinking about antibiotic resistant infections and host microbe interactions, uh, but phage therapy is grounding itself as a legitimate alternative to antibiotics. And I appreciate you giving us a cutting edge sense of where that is. Um, also, you didn't know I was gonna give a kind invitation. So I kindly thank you for predicting that I would based on your slide. <laughs> Let me open up the floor for questions, curiosities, and thoughts as we have a few more minutes uh, with Ben. And feel free to uh, write your question in the chat box or unmike yourself or raise your hand. I will get us started as people think. Um, you know, the one area that I think a lot about because we study intracellular bacteria in various types of animals uh, is what is the future of phage therapy for intracellular infections? And perhaps you've come across this issue if bugs have facultative intracellular options in their lifestyle. And yeah, uh, yeah what, what's the field thinking about with those? Yeah, that's a, that's a, a real tough one. Um, accessing bacteria intracellularly is, I, it's, a, it's a big hurdle. Um, I've heard reports that they've actually just end up inside the cell somehow. Um, yep. We haven't looked a lot at that. Um, collaborators have for some of the pseudomonas phages, um, but I think people are looking at, uh, especially in, you know, for like TB or something, uh, people are looking to treat, uh, you know, people that live in the same house as someone that's got TB to try and prevent uh, infection um, in those people. Um, and I know there are some people that are trying to throw phages into liposomes and nebulize those for for uh, TB infection. Um, but we see it in the uh, joint space too, because there's actually a lot of, and, and UTIs, um, intracellular bugs there. Um, and that that's just one that I don't have a good answer for. I think liposomes might be one way to do it, um, yeah. but we're only seeing it at the exacerbation side. Yeah, there's some evidence from Jerry, Jeremy Barr's lab that um, yeah. phages can transcend cells, right, and mm -hmm. move between them. So maybe yeah. that maybe they're less restrictive than we think, at least for certain. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, Perseus has raised his hand. Uh, go ahead, Perseus. Oh, sorry, uh, Ben. Last question. Um, how do you see this being scalable in the clinical microbiology and from the bench to bed side? How will this play out in once it becomes more commonplace? Yeah, that part is, is, I think in terms of scale, it's not so bad because we can, gen, we can create phages for same if not less cost than chemical antibiotics. Um, sensitivity testing is actually not that bad. Um, it, the, the turnaround time now is the same as chemical antibiotics. Um, so if we can grow it up to test the sensitivity to you know, the amino glycosides, we can test phages alongside it. Um, it's going to be harder, I think, in, in hospitals, maybe that don't have the expertise, I guess. Um, but, you know, once that catches up, like people come up with a, with a good treatment course pretty quickly. I think it's, it's definitely, the, I hope, the direction in that, you know, hospitals are going to be more invested in personalized care, right? So it's, this sort of forces uh, physicians and, and pharmacists to like actually think about individual cases in a more personalized way. And so I think that that's, it's just going to be the direction and there may be some growing pains, but um, hopefully we get there soon. Looks like we have a question from, uh, let's see, was the hand raised? Or did I miss it? Go ahead if you raised your hand. Uh, hi, uh, am I audible? Yes, go ahead. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so uh, my question is like, how do uh, like how much feasible do you think this phase therapy is? Like in terms of uh, like uh, you know there are this cystic fibrosis 
and people are like facing it like almost daily so how will you like yeah as um, i think dr persius has already asked you so about the scaling thing so like vaccines and antibiotics like you can scale it in a large scale and then can be used but what about the phase therapy like how much easier will it be for use and is it something like a personalized medicine kind of thing like for every individual the uh, phase therapy should be different or something um, so every case is not necessarily treated differently. So the sensitivity is what is going to drive that. So we, we basically grow the phages on, you know, safe hosts. So we know it's not contaminated with other toxins or prophages or something. And so oftentimes that phage can treat, you know, several different people. And in terms of just volume, you know, just in a basic microbiology lab, we can grow, you know, in a liter, if it's a decent phage enough to treat, you know, 10 to 100 people um, for the full course. So volume wise, it's not difficult to scale up. Uh, in terms of the number of individuals treated, it's not necessarily difficult to scale up. Um, and then the personalized bit, yeah, definitely personalized um, in terms of like the right phage for the person, but it doesn't have to be a phage grown on that individual person's uh, bacteria to treat them. Okay, okay, I see. Thank you so much. You have given a really nice presentation. And for me, like the phage therapy is like totally different thing. I work on antibiotics. So this is something very new to me, this phage yeah, therapy. No. <laughs> cool. Very yeah. great work. Yeah, happy it worked. Yeah. Thank, thank you for that question. Thank great. Uh, Athena, go ahead. So I want to echo um, what a great seminar this is. You have great slides, great talk. It was it was really easy to follow and I really appreciate that. Um, so earlier you were talking about how it could be difficult to administer the phage therapy that they really need to be in the site of infection. Uh, and maybe I missed it. I just wanted to ask, um, as we're talking about scaling up and when you treated these, um, these patients, uh, what, is, what do you imagine the course of administration to be for the phage therapy? Like physically, how do you get it in? Yeah, so I guess that's gonna, it depends on the type of infection. So for lungs, we've been nebulizing them. Um, yeah, I guess I didn't really mention that. So we, for all these uh, pulmonary infections, we're using a nebulizer. Um, and so before we get to that point, we usually test phages in a few nebulizers to make sure that they can survive that process. And we don't see big losses uh, for some value of big um, in that process. Um, and then for some of these other cases, like in the, the joint space, um, they were given during, you know, uh, when they're trying to, when they're doing a debridement, um, they also will just treat top, topically. I mean, they've opened up the joint. Um, and so we, we get a lot of topical there. Um, we also have instilled them to the joint space after a um, debridement, uh, basically through a, a Hickman, where it just basically directly instills it into the joint space and we drain out and irrigate that way. Um, and then abscesses, uh, you know, depending on location and, and, and ability to access them, they can be, you know, basically needle punctured, uh, aspirate out the fluid, uh, and then instill it with phage um, that way. Um, so so there, that, that's what I mean just by like, direct administration. Um, IV is tough, I, I, in, you know, yeah. But oh, for, so for like LVADs, uh, left ventricular assist device infections, because we see a lot of those. Um, that also depends, um, but we try to do, you know, obviously a lot of the time it's the drive line that's coming up, it's wound is infected. And so we can instill phages directly up there, depending on where we think the infection is, um, or pack the, the wound with, uh, with just phages that way. But we don't usually do IV unless absolutely necessary. Great, thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. Okay, and with that, we will conclude the talk. I want to thank uh, our speaker again for educating us, inspiring us, and I hope everybody enjoys the World Microbiome Day festivities around the world throughout the week. Uh, there's lots of events happening. Check out social media for those. And uh, if anybody's interested in joining the Vanderbilt Microbiome team, just send us an email through the contact form and we will get you on our listserv. Thanks. Thanks, Ben. Appreciate it. Yeah. Hey, thanks for having me. All right. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.